السلام عليكم ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم له دعوه الحق والذين يدعون من دونه لا يستجيبون لهم بشيء الا كباسط كفيه الى الماء ليبلغ فاه وما هو ببالغه وما دعاء الكافرين الا في ضلال رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي فالحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد ايفريون وانس اجين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته um, I've been thinking about how to present uh, the parable today that belongs to Surah Al-Ra'd uh, and it's the 14th ayah of Surah Al-Ra'd, so Surah number 13, ayah number 14 uh, that includes a very brief parable but it's a very heavy reality that Allah has and a very heavy concept that Allah has summarized in uh, this ayah so what I'm going to do is first try to elaborate that concept and then kind of show you how Allah is talking about that concept in brief language. One of the great features of the Qur'an is brevity. What that means is Allah will say something very brief, but that brief small comment will include an entire worldview inside it. Right? So I, I'm just going to take a little bit of time to explain that worldview that's encap encapsulated in the opening comment of this ayah, لَهُ دَعْوَةُ الْحَقِّ لَهُ دَعْوَةُ الْحَقِّ can be translated that he alone owns the true call, one way of looking at it. So it's idafatul mawsuf ila sifa. Or, you know, so, so he alone owns the true call. Or it could be he alone deserves to be called on in truth. So there's kind of multiple meanings here. But I want to start with something very basic, take you guys with me on this journey and get you, inshallah, to the same place. You see, uh, I'll start with a parable, an, or an example of my own. Let's just say you were driving and you had a flat tire, right? And uh, you had to pull up to the side of the road, and now you need help, you know, changing your tire. So you get out of the car, you have a spare in the back, and you start, you know, you have a jack, and you start lifting the car, and you start working on replacing the tire, but you couldn't lift it anymore. You could only lift it so much, but you don't possess the strength to go any further. And so at this point, you've done everything you could and you needed additional help. And somebody was passing by and you said, hey, could you help me out for a second over here? Because uh, I'm, I'm not able to do any more. And you asked for help at the point where you were done exhausting your resources, right? So you did everything you could and then you asked for somebody else's help. This kind of help, when you have already done your part and then you're asking for somebody to help finish the job, basically. That's actually called Aoun in Arabic. Aoun is one of the Arabic words for help. Uh, it's the same word we use in the Fatiha when we say iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. It's the same origin word, Aoun. Uh, another example of something similar. So the idea, by the way, just to compare, if you had a flat tire, you pulled up to the side of the road, continued to sit in your car, and somebody walking by, you said, hey, could you... Uh, I have a flat tire, you want to help me out? I'm, you know, it's a little hot outside, so I'm just going to stay here. But you please do help me out. That's not isti'ana, you're not seeking aun because you're, you didn't do your part. You're just, you're asking for help without any contribution of your own. You understand, okay? Similarly, you have the concept of nasr, the help of Allah, or istinsar, to ask for help from Allah, okay? The, the word nasr is actually used originally in the Arabic language for military aid. It's not just used generally, it's used for military aid. So for example, there's two armies, you know, back in the day, one army showed up on one hilltop, the other one showed on the other hilltop, and they just slid down and they clashed into one another, and one of them is losing, the other one's winning, etc. And then a reinforcement arrives uh, from the side, you know, aiding one of, the, one of the armies, right? And just coming from the side and uh, reinforcing them, that would be Nasr. That would be additional help, right? So. There are multiple concepts in the Qur'an that illustrate the same reality. Allah's help comes and Allah's, Allah responds and helps in some way, but the first step has to be taken by the believer. In fact, the Fatiha begins that way. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ It's actually, you have to do the, the ibadah, try to do it yourself, and then you ask Allah, then you're in a position to ask Allah 
for help. So there's this recipro reciprocity. Um, the subject is made extremely clear in places like Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah says, "Ujibu da'wat al-da'i ida da'an, fal yastajibu li." I will respond. Allah says, Allah talking about Himself, He says, "I respond to the one who calls, whenever they call, whatever call they make, whenever they call, I respond immediately." Therefore, they should also respond to me. So now you're asking Allah to respond to you, and Allah is saying, and you should also be responding to me. So it's a two-way street. So what I'm trying to get at in, in the Qur'an, and, and I want to contrast this with other religions, in the Qur'an, our relationship with Allah is actually reciprocal in some way. We ask Allah, and Allah is also asking us. In fact, we start by doing what Allah asks, and that puts us in a position to ask Allah. Okay? Now, let's take one more step along these lines. And this again, a, a different kind of analogy before we get to this, uh, this ayah. Uh, and that is that, you know, what you ask for, what you want in life, a lot of times, if not all the time, it's determined by what your goal is. If, for example, there's a young man whose goal is to be selected for a football team. Let's say that's his goal. If that's his goal, then what does he want? He wants the right kind of coach. He wants the right kind of training schedule. He wants the right kind of nutrition. He wants the right kind of sleep schedule. He wants the right kind of regiment. He wants the right kind of improvement. If you ask him, what do you want? Well, I want these kinds of shoes. Or I want this kind of opportunity. Or I want this kind of a coach. This is what he wants. He's not going to ask you for a PlayStation. He's not going to ask you for you know, uh, you know, a new shirt or something. Because that's not on his mind is, I got to join this team. So all of his wants, all the things that he needs to fulfill that ultimate dream, every, every other thing that he desires is in line with that. It's in line with that. So once you have a goal in mind, then your wants become aligned with that goal. And sometimes even when we give people presents, right? You can give people, if you don't care about people, you can give them useless presents or re-gift. Right? People give you useless stuff like blenders and then you give it to them. So you could do that. But if you care about somebody and they're just, for example, they're just joining university or they're just, you know, they're just about to go on you know, some business trip or something, you get them something that helps them in school, like you get them a new laptop or something, or you get them something that actually helps them in their purpose, right? So we, we, we want things based on goals. We want things based on goals. Now, what happens to someone who doesn't have clearly identified goals? Someone who says, yeah, I, my goal is I want to be happy. Okay, well, if that's your fuzzy goal, then what's going to happen? Well, you know what? Today I want ice cream because that'll make me happy. And tomorrow I want a video game because that'll make me happy. And you're going to keep coming up with new things. And guess what? None of them will do one thing that you want, which is what? Make you happy. You'll have ice cream and still be depressed. You'll, play, you'll, you'll get this, that, or the other. Because you you're no closer to any kind of target. Right? When you, when you, when you acquire something that you wanted, and it even takes you one inch closer to your goal, you feel like that was worth something. It got you somewhere. But when you're aimless, and you have no, no real ob objective, then even if you get things you want in the moment, it didn't lead to anything. It, didn't, it wasn't part of a bigger picture, you understand? So now, let's, with, that, with these couple of concepts in mind, let's come back to this ayah. Allah says, لَهُ دَعْوَةُ الْحَقِّ which can, The word da'wah can actually mean two things. Da'wah can mean a call. A call. So da'watul haq is me calling on Allah is actually also da'wah. Me call. So it's another word for dua. Many people here are familiar with the word dua. Da'wah in Arabic is another word for dua. So when I do a dua to Allah, I'm actually doing a da'wah to Allah also. Okay? So a call to Allah, asking Allah for something. Asking Allah for something. That's one obvious meaning. The other meaning, because the idafa is interesting in that way, and then the lahu in the beginning, the milkiya, it also refers to Allah calling on you. So you have two things merged in this, in this phrase. You're asking Allah for something, 
And Allah says, the only one, and how, do, how does this ayah help us understand that concept? <laughs> Allah is saying, in the end, when you ask for something, the only time you really truly ask for anything is when you've asked Allah. Anything else and anyone else you ask is actually not even asking. It wasn't even really asking because it didn't count for anything. It was empty, it, it was thin air. The only one who ever responds to you is actually Allah. So, lahu da'watul haqq, the true call that is ever made, is actually only ever made to Allah. On the flip side, Allah is also saying that the call to live, the demand that is made, the true demand that is made, how should you live, what, what is expected of you. No, no one else is calling you to do something that is more justified and rightful than Allah's call on me. Like what Allah is asking me to do, what Allah has invited me to do, the way Allah has invited me to be, that's real. Everything else is fake in comparison. Lahu da'watul haqq. So there's this duality in this phrase. Now there's a relationship between those two things. Imagine just by visual, because I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing a visual from another surah in the Quran, when Allah says, فَلَقْتَحَمَ الْعَقَبَ فَلَقْتَحَمَ الْعَقَبَ he, he wasn't able to climb the mountain. He wasn't able to scale the mountain. So let's take the Im image, image, Allah wants me to climb a mountain. Let's use that image, okay? Allah wants me to climb a mountain. If that's the call Allah made, climb this mountain, then you know what? That became my objective. And because that became my objective, now I'm going to ask Allah for things that help me fulfill that objective. Now I'm going to ask Allah for strength. Why am I asking Allah for strength? It'll help me climb that mountain. I will ask Allah for better lung capacity because as you climb up, you start running out of breath because it's going to help me climb that mountain. I'm going to ask Allah for the kind of shoes I can use to climb this mountain or the kind of rope that I can use to climb this mountain or the hook or a teacher or a trainer or partners that can help me scale this mountain, right? Uh, or, or recovery from injury if I've slipped and I can get back up and keep climbing on this mountain. Everything I'm asking Allah for has to do with the mission Allah set me on and now I'm asking him in line with that. Think of uh, Musa alayhi salam when he was sent to challenge Fir'aun. What did he ask Allah? He said, Rabbi shahli sadri wa yassirli amri. Ya Allah expand my chest. Because obviously expanding chest means I won't have anxiety. Because he knows he's going to someone who masters in causing people anxiety. That's his expertise. He can make you feel nervous, he can make you feel anxious. Rabbi shahli sadri. He's about to go take on the world's greatest superpower, wa yassirli amri. He has a problem speaking himself. He wants to make sure that whatever he's going to say is understood by everybody. He might feel alone and intimidated. Everything he's asking for is actually because Allah said, Go to Fir'aun. That's the mission. Now that he's been told to climb that mountain, everything he's asking for is in line with that mission. Now many of you have heard, uh, Ustad, I've heard that you should, you should ask Allah for everything. The hadith says, even a shoelace. You've heard that before? Ask Allah for everything, even a shoelace. Therefore, I ask Allah for a new car, and I ask Allah for you know, a new this, or a nicer that, or, because the hadith says, ask even for a shoelace. Yeah, but you're not looking at the whole picture. If that shoelace is going to help you tie your shoe better, so you can climb that mountain, then ask for the shoelace. It's not in isolation, randomly I decided to ask for a banana and then I asked for a shoelace and then I asked for, you know, Velcro shoes or whatever. That's not the point that's being made. The point that be, that's being made is, once you embark on that journey towards Allah, then whatever you need to successfully embark on that journey, you ask Allah for, whether it's small or it's big. Everything is in line with that journey. And you're asking Allah to remove things from your path that will distract you from your goal. The problem, the, 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 what I want you to understand here is, it's as if first Allah set my eyes on a goal, and because I became clear about my goal, the nature of my du'as changed. The nature of my, what I'm asking, what I'm begging Allah for changed. Because my objectives have entirely changed. Just like I was telling you, the young man who wants to join a football team, the things he's going to ask for are not going to be the same as some other young man who's not trying out for a team. He has no goal in front of him. He just wants to enjoy his summer vacation 
or something like that. They're, they're not the same. And in fact, even if you get temporary joy without having a larger objective, you might enjoy it very temporarily, but the feeling of emptiness settles in very, very quickly. But when you actually get purposeful dua, purposeful prayer, then even if it's a small thing, because you know it's working towards a larger goal, you appreciate it, you thank Allah more for it, and it, takes, it propels you even further. This is the, the, one of the great hikam carry, captured inside Lahu da'watul haqq. Now, let's compare this to other religious worldviews. In other religious worldviews, I speak of them sometimes in condescending terms. I don't mean to be condescending to other religions. But I do want you to understand how Muslims have adopted practices and we've been, we've been impressed with other religious traditions. Some of you heard my khutbah today um, uh, before you fell asleep. Uh, I was talking about when, when the Israelites crossed the water, they crossed the water and now they've escaped Fir'aun. And they have their prophet with them, who's shown them multiple miracles, and they pass by a village, you know, Ya'kufuna lil asnam, that used to sit in front of idols and meditate. They pass by this town that was idol worshipping, and they sat by idols and meditated, and they said, Ij'al, Ya Musa, Ij'al lana ilahan kamalahum aliha. Can you make us a god like this one? The, I mean, these guys, are, this is pretty good stuff. Can we have one of these too? Why can't we have it like that? You know? Why is it that they wanted that? Because I want you to understand and understand the, 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 the nature of consumer religion. Consumer religion. Consumer religion is I have a, the only reason I worship a god is because that god will give me something I want. Okay? So I go, to, I go to this god and I'll, you know, put some milk in front of it and put some whatever flowers in front of it and, you know, do the thing and the candles and all of that stuff and then I'll tell him I really want my uncle to die because if he doesn't die then I'm not going to get the village, the, 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 the horse. My dad signed it off to my uncle. I'm next in line so I really need him to die. And the, the uncle is right next to him and he's going, I really need my nephew to die because... <laughs> Now it just depends who's going to push who off the mountain in the, from the temple or whatever. <laughs> but the, the idea is you're, you're turning to a god because you have a wish and you're going to worship and sacrifice and do whatever and in exchange your wish will be granted. So du'as, du'a in other religions, du'a is actually just a wish. It's a wish list. You go to that god with your wish list and you say, God, I want to marry this girl, or I want to marry this guy, or I want to do this, or I, I want my, uh, you know, so, some lady came to me, I can't, some things just traumatized me for life, man. This lady came up to me, she said, what do you do if Allah never answers your dua? I was like, what dua is this? She goes, I've, I've made, I fasted and made this dua, I've prayed tahajjud and made this dua, I went to the haram, I did umrah, I did umrah in Ramadan and made this dua, Allah is not answering my dua. I was like, which dua is this? Can you tell, can you tell me a little bit about it? I'll go to the side, you know. She goes, yeah. I really want my daughter to marry this boy, and she says no. I made so much dua. And, so, so, and Allah is not answering my dua. So, so you believe that you have a wish, and Allah should answer your dua by handing you a psychological remote control. You can press like him and point it at your daughter, and your daughter's entire personality will change because you asked Allah to ex exert control on another human being. Our messenger was told, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, lasta alayhim bi musaytir. You are not in control over other people, but you, lady, want to ask Allah to hand you control over another living soul, because you want them to do something you want, and they don't want it. How dare they? And you're like, Allah is not answering my dua. You know what that is? Allah is not granting my wish. That's not a dua. And you know where these kinds of duas come from? They come from a lack of real purpose. Your purpose is much, letter, much lesser. Oh, if she marries this boy, then that's a really rich family. Then we get to say we married in this rich family. Or my, you know, my, my cousins will be happy, or this one will be happy, or this one will say this and this. That's your goal. Your goal is very low. And because your goal is low, the things you're asking Allah for are in line with that low goal. That's what's actually happening. When you set your goal higher, the things you ask Allah for are going to be higher. And so you find a lot of people setting their goals low and then asking for lower things of Allah 
and then getting frustrated with Allah that He's not giving me what I want because now we're turning our religion into consumer religion. We want Allah to, we place the order, especially in the odd nights of Ramadan, we're going to place a lot of orders. You know, we're going to make our wish list and we're going to come to Allah. And if that doesn't get answered, then hey, come on, what's going on over here? I'd even, I, you know, the masjids around the country, they get, they get the people in their boards or if you have an office line or whatever, it gets overrun. Dua ki raat kaun si hai? Right, which one is the night of dua again? Is it tomorrow? Is it today? Is it Because I have a list, I gotta, I gotta get through my list. Right? And we have this, this concept, we, we've developed this conception of how the things we want in this dunya, that's what the deen is for. The purpose of the deen is to ask Allah for things we want in this dunya. That was the purpose of every other religion. When Allah says, Allah alone owns the true call, what is Allah's call? Allah's call is to be ready to meet Him. That's Allah's call. Da'watul Haqq is actually ultimately, the, the Allah is inviting us to be able to meet Him on Judgment Day. To not be among the people that Allah says about them, لا ينظر إليهم يوم القيامة ولا يزكيهم He won't look at certain people on Resurrection Day. And He won't purify them. He doesn't want us to be from those people. He says, وُجُوهٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ نَاظِرَةٌ إِلَى رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةٌ some, place, some faces will be lit, nadira, they'll be lit, they'll be illuminated, staring at their Rabb. He wants us to be those people. If that's, the, if that's the goal, I need to meet Allah. That's the goal that's been set. Then my du'as are in line with that. And I'm not saying you become a saint and you don't care about anything in this life. That is not what I'm saying at all. In fact, now what, what I'm saying is, two things become inseparable. Two things become inseparable. The blessings of this life and how the blessings of this life are connected to the blessings of the next life. How? We go around the, the, the Kaaba and we get to a certain portion of the Haram uh, and the, the Kaaba and we're doing Tawaf and we say, Rabbana atina fid dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab nar Give us, the, give us beautiful good things in this life and give us beautiful good things in the next life. Hasana in this life, hasana in the next life. That's not asking for two separate things actually. <laughs> We're asking for one thing. We're asking for good things in this life that lead to good things in the next life. If you get good things in this life that have nothing to do with good things in the next life, that's a problem. There ha and that's why right before that dua, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقِ There's among these people who say, Ya Allah, give me in this world, give me this, give me this girl in marriage, give me this car, give me this job, give me this money, give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this. Dunya. And Allah says, they have not, no portion in the Akhirah. And you would imagine if that, that dua is saying, that ayah is saying, don't ask about dunya. But the next ayah made you ask about dunya again. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. Why? Allah is teaching us that we should be asking for things in this world that benefit us in the next world. What this also does is that it teaches me humility. A lot of humility. I can be very sure about what I want. I can be very sure about what I want. But I don't know that. I, don't, I, I feel it. This is what I want. Ya Allah, if I have this, I will be a good servant. I will fulfill my purpose towards you. I will be able to do good. Ya Allah, just give me this. And Allah could, in His wisdom, decide, no, actually, you think you want this. And you think this is the best thing for you. But it's not. And I won't give it to you. That can happen. That can absolutely happen. Nuh alayhi salam must have thought that if, son, if, if his son becomes a believer, it's the best thing ever. Father and son will do da'wah together. The, 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 the deen of Allah will be served. Allah decided, no, I'm not going to give you that du'a. Ibrahim alayhi salam must have decided, the, the one who makes the idols, his father, if he becomes Muslim, then the entire shirk manufacturing industry in the region will shut down. This is great. What a great aid to Islam. And I'm sure he asked for the guidance of his father. Allah didn't answer that prayer. <coughs> so Allah responding, Allah responding is on Allah's terms, not on our terms. We ask to the best of our ability, but we have to have a level of humility that Allah's plan is better than what we can ask. And we cannot say, Ya Allah, you didn't answer according to my wishes, my thinking, 
my strategy, we have to develop a humility. I also add something else to this concept, and that is we have to develop a sense of agility. Agility means I asked Allah for something, I don't see that Allah is giving it to me, right? I asked Allah for one door to open, and that door is not opening. I keep asking, I keep asking, and that door is not opening. And for five years I'm frustrated with Allah because Allah is not opening that door. And you know what? Maybe in those five years I chose to become blind to the 100 other doors that Allah opened because I don't want any of those, I want this one. I'm stubborn with, I'm telling Allah this door or nothing else. I'm being the, and then I'm saying Allah is not answering me. You ever see a bird that's trying to get out of a window but one window is closed and the other one's open and it's smacking its head into the glass? I, I feel like sometimes we're that bird and we're like, Ya Allah, uh, come on, uh. <laughs> just turn a little bit and get out. There's another door opened. No, but that's not the one I want though. <laughs> Because we have, we have our own stubbornness. We يَدْعُ الْإِنسَانُ بِالشَّرْ دُعَاءَهُ بِالْخَيْرِ A human being is asking for something bad for himself, very convinced they're asking for something good. عَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ It could very well be you hate something, but it's good for you. It could be something you love, but it's bad for you. وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah knows you don't know. So now, having given you that, that, that opening, let's see what Allah is saying about this lahu da'watul haq. That Allah, in the end, truly, if you have asked, you've only truly asked Allah. The word da'wah, one, one more introductory comment on the meaning of the word da'wah. Da'wah actually also means to invite. Invite someone. When you honor someone and you invite them to your home, that's also da'wah. But da'wah is also used when you need somebody's personal help. So for example, in the Qur'an you have فَلْيَدْعُ نَادِيَةِ سَنَدْعُ الزَّبَانِيَةِ Right? Like if you needed help, for example, fixing something in your home and you call a bunch of guys. Hey, I need to move some furniture. Can you come over? Right? That's also da'wah. That's also calling somebody for the purpose of help. When you're using the word da'wah with Allah, lahu da'watul haq, it's as if you're asking Allah's personal intervention, personal involvement in, in whatever it is that you're doing. You, you want Allah to intervene and Allah to take part in what it is that you're doing. Just like Allah wanted Himself to invite you himself to his path. Now you're asking, inviting Allah your, himself to come to your aid. And it's as if Allah is saying, and there's nobody in the end who responds to you except me anyway. There's nobody else. In reality, al-haq here, referring to reality, in the end, nobody responds to your call except Allah. وَالَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِهِ لَا يَسْتَجِيبُونَ لَهُمْ بِشَيْءٍ And those who they call other than Allah, they cannot even begin to respond to them with anything. They have no ability to respond. Now the analogy, now the, the, the parable that Allah gives. إِلَّا كَبَاسِطِ كَفَّيْهِ إِلَى الْمَاءِ لِيَبْلُغَ فَاهُ وَمَا هُوَ بِبَالِغِهِ Like the one who has his hands open, stretched out, to reach to the water. To reach water that it can come to his mouth. But it will never reach it. it will, he'll never reach it. Now this image can be understood multiple ways. So let's go through these multiple ways. We'll start with an image that Ali radiallahu anhu painted. The painting Ali radiallahu anhu painted with his words describing this ayah. Imagine somebody at the mouth of a well. The water is deep inside. You're at the top of the well. And there's no rope or bucket or nothing. Right? And you really need the water. You were traveling in the desert. You're dying of thirst. You got to the tip of this well. You need the water. So you just kind of lean over. And are trying, uh, trying to get to the water. And you're like, I think I felt something. And it was because it, it's too far, bro. It's too far. Right? So that's one image. Like those who call an other than Allah are engaged in something as silly as the guy who's leaning over in a well trying to reach the water with his arms and the water is way down there. Like, if you, if you actually, actually think about that, it's the image of somebody acting really stupid. <laughs> that's, that's what the image is, you know? And then another way to understand this imagery is a mirage, like in Surah An-Nur. Somebody's traveling in the desert, they think it's water. Ah, <gasps> and they just they, they stick their hand in the sand. <sighs> right? And it's, it's not there, because it's, it's an illusion. 
And you're, you're looking at that and saying, how stupid is this guy? And then another, the third way you can think about this is somebody who even does reach the water. But when they reach the water, basiti kafehi, they keep their palm open. If you want to drink water, you do this. You make, a, you make a cup out of your hand. You close your fist a little bit, right? You close your palm a little bit. But imagine somebody who's... You keep slipping out. Kabasati kafehi. Wamahu abibaligi is never going to reach it. It's not going to reach his mouth. This is the example of someone who asks other than Allah, who doesn't ask rooted in da'watul haqq. They keep asking for things and running into desperation. The image captures stupidity, it captures desperation. Somebody who's desperate, somebody who's acting ridiculous. They don't even, they don't, they're, and they're doing something that no sensible person would, would do, but they're doing it anyway. They don't even know why they're doing it. Like no reasonable person would do this. You'd have to have lost your mind to be able to do, to do something like that. And so he says, وَمَا دُعَاءُ الْكَافِرِينَ إِلَّا فِي ضُلَالِ And the call of kafirin, the call of disbelievers, it doesn't fall anywhere except in complete waste. It goes into complete ruin. <coughs> we have to learn to make dua to Allah purposefully. We have to acknowledge لَهُ دَعْوَةُ الْحَقِّ first. And then based on that da'watul haqq, we make our du'as. Now let's look at the du'as in the Qur'an. Look, I have du'as to Allah. I, I make du'a to Allah for my family, my parents, you know, my spouse, my children, etc. I make du'a for, you know, for myself. You know, I have different kinds of du'as I make to Allah. And then there are du'as that Allah Azza wa Jal taught us in the Qur'an. Right? Because it's as if, you know, if you look at the story of Adam alayhi salam, he was sent down to earth, he was really ashamed about what happened. He, he was so ashamed, he didn't even have the words. So Allah says, فَتَلَقَّ آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتِ Like Allah gave him, brought him into contact with words. Because he didn't even know what words to use. And then Allah taught him the words to say, and then Allah accepted his tawbah. فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ right? In that sense, when Allah says, يُعَلِّمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُونَ about the Qur'an, Allah teaches you what you couldn't have known yourself. Allah teaches you what you could not have known yourself. What Allah is also teaching us is these the du'as that Allah has given us in the Qur'an. The things that prophets asked for, that by extension we ask for. Or the things like, for example, رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَةً وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ That there is wisdom in those prayers. You're asking, you're, you're asking Allah for something so smart that it's actually endorsed by Allah Himself. It's as if Allah who made me and made you who knows us better than we know ourselves, like he asks, Allah يَعْلَمُ مَنْ خَلَقْ Doesn't he know who he created? Then now that he knows who he created, he says, by the way, here's what you should ask for yourself. Here's what you should ask for yourself. Like, just put that in perspective. Here's what, something I want to ask, and here's Allah recommending, by the way, if it was me, here's what I would ask. Put this in another analogous perspective. You have something you want to eat, and then your trainer or your nutritionist or whoever tells you, here's what I recommend you should eat. You want to take some medicine, your doctor tells you, hey, by the way, here's the prescription that you should be following. You want to sign the contract for a real estate deal or whatever yourself, your lawyer says, here's what I recommend. Who are you going to trust? Yourself? No, 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 just, I got this. No, you're going to, you're going to take the lawyer's word serious, the doctor seriously. The trainers here, you take all these people seriously because they know better. They know better. We, if one acknowledges Allah knows me better than I know myself, then what I should be asking for myself, there has to be a level of acknowledgement and humility in me that says, I need to ask Allah what He recommended I ask Him. That's, I need to give myself to that. And then other things that I want to ask will come under its shade. In fact, I would even argue the dua that Allah has, the ad'iyah that Allah has taught us in the Qur'an, the different duas Allah has taught us in the Qur'an, they are so encompassing and they're so complete that anything you would have asked for is covered anyway. Like there's nothing you could have come up with that you would have asked for that isn't already incorporated in the perfect requests that Allah taught us to make in His book. SubhanAllah. 
And then now compare that to the Du'a'ul Kafirin. Who are the Kafirin calling to? The Du'a'ul Kafirin now has two meanings. By the way, notice the word Da'wa was used for Allah. And there's two words for Da'wa in Arabic. Da'wa and Du'a. And Allah separated His word, Lahu Da'watul Haqq, from the Du'a'ul Kafirin at the end. He didn't say, Wa ma Da'watul Kafirin illa fi He said, Ma Du'a'ul Kafirin. Distinguishing the two. As if they are two completely different things. Like even verbally, they're not given the same word, even though they're synonymous in some sense. They're, they're separated. But even Du'a'ul Kafirin is two things. It's what the Kafir asks for is gone to waste, and what they're asking you for is just waste. They're also calling you to something. The Kafirin are also calling, like Allah is calling to something, the Kafir is also calling to something. They're also inviting to something. And Allah is saying, when they ask, to their false gods or each other, it goes to waste, and whatever they're calling you to is nothing but going to waste. I'm really excited that we've made this much progress in our, um, our journey through the parables. Uh, tomorrow is actually one of my probably favorite parables in the Quran, inshallah, also from Surah Al Ra'd. So those of you who can make it tomorrow, I know, I know a lot of you came out tonight, Friday, Friday night, Islamic fever, I get it. But, uh, if you can make it tomorrow, inshallah, please do try and make it tomorrow, because that tomorrow night's a special parable that's also a uh, part of Surah Al-Ra'ad. So I'll conclude with that today. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Kaim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum everyone. There are almost 50,000 students around the world that are interested on top of the students we have in studying the Quran and its meanings and being able to learn that and share that with family and friends. And they need sponsorships, which is not very expensive. So if you can help sponsor students on Bayina TV, please do so and visit our sponsorship page. I appreciate it so much and pray that Allah gives our mission success and we're able to share the meanings of the Quran and the beauty of it the world over.